Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I didn't know which topic to talk in this workshop today. Uh, we have it's kind of a first workshop in the new department, so I decided to talk a little bit about history of electrical splitting and at the end of the talk about what's new in electrical splitting. I'd like to thank you for coming. I thank Eliezer Giladi here, which is we work together and he's one of the reasons I'm in Tel Aviv University. <laughs> I met him in a Gordon conference a long time ago and he convinced me to come here. Um, electro, electro, electroless plating is an old technique. If you talk about old techniques, when you, I'll jump to the next slide. This is a artifact uh, that was produced in the what's called pre-Columbian period. It's about second or uh, third or fourth century. And it was made in interest technique. They made plates of metal using electroless plating by, by um, without reducing aging using some, using the what's called immersion technique and then put plate over plate over plate. And this component, it's a copper coated with electroless plating of gold. You can find it in the Rockefeller collection. So electroless plating is, if you talk about old techniques, this is old technique. You can discuss maybe this is nanotechnology, but definitely. In the modern area, the famous work of Wurtz in 1844 who published a paper. And this is, a, I couldn't find the paper, but uh, below I put some references which quote this paper, so I, I guess it's correct. I couldn't find it in the internet, neither in the, our library. But he produced kind of a black powder. He mixed uh, salt of nickel with sodium hypophosphate and produced uh, nickel. So nickel plating is an old technique. <coughs> However, the bright, what we call today coating or bright plating was the, uh, also <coughs> achieved, in 19, uh, was achieved in 1911, 1916, 1931. There are papers and papers and papers. However, uh, we, in the community, we refer that it was uh, Brenner and Riedel who discovered in 1946 electroless nickel plating. And this is the recipe they use, and it still works. We use it sometimes. So this is what they call a good process. Use, how do you do electroless plating? You mix metal salt, put a, a reducing agent, a, cook it in the right pH, in the right temperature, and you have the position. And uh, like most Americans, they use the strange units of uh, 0.3 mil per hour, which you translate it to normal units, which is about 5 to 8 microns per hour, which is not so bad. It's a 0.008 millimeter, so it's a 8 micron. <laughs> and, uh, and this is, by the way, the uh, typical deposition for electroless plating, which is usually in the range of nanometer per minute, uh, hundreds of nanometer per minute. It's not a very fast deposition, but it's enough. And we, in electroless plating, you find papers, what we call electroless deposition or immersion deposition, which is also electroless, but it's a different way, or it's practically a metal displacement type deposition. In this, what we call electroless deposition, we mix the reducing agent with the metal complex together. So the electrons are coming from the solution. So about 20, about 22 years ago, somebody published a nice paper called 50 Years of Electroless Nickel. So we decided to, after 22 years, uh, Professor Osaka from Waseda University, Professor Kinaka, Sugiyama san Valerie Dumin, and myself, we decided to write a nice paper. We call it 30 Year of uh, electroless plating. And uh, why did we write this paper? Because what happened in the, uh, this is, sorry, this is the process. I will skip the process because this is not introduction to electrochemistry. And the idea, what happened in the last 30 years? Why do we write the paper on what's new in the last 30 years? The reason is in the last 30 years, in the era of advanced microelectronics, there, many, there were a lot of what we call diversity. Electroless plating became a diverse technology. People use it in many, many applications. And today I'm going to summarize four applications and our knowledge and what kind of research we do now and, uh, and how it's related to, to the previous talk. <laughs> because we also study catalysis. 
uh, quality, we can produce cobalt, tungsten, phosphorus, uh, metal on 12 inch silicon wafers with a thickness of less than 10 nanometer with a homogeneity and uh, uniformity which is beyond what we can measure. Imagine 10 nanometer thickness of a 30 centimeter wafer. It's a, the quality is really fantastic. Reliability, I'm going to show you how we can make it reliable and reproducible. And also, the last and not the least is the modeling, which basically the theoretical, the theoretical understanding. What exactly happening? Catalytic effect during this process, because this is an autocatalytic process. In the last uh, 30 years, due to the progress in electron microscopy and other material science techniques, we now understand the level of understanding is now much di different than what happened in 30 years before. So I'm going to talk today about electroless deposition for interconnect, which is, this is what I did, uh, what part, a large part of our work at Cornell University, which I worked with the late professor G. Mayer, who convinced me, he, he told me, Yossi, you have to work on electroless plating. I asked why, he said, I've been working on electroplating, these people are working on sputtering, nobody works on electroless plating. So it's a good for a young faculty member. Told him I'm not electrochemist. He said, no problem, <laughs> hire a chemist. So we hired a guy named Roman Bielski, and we started to work in the first publication. Uh, uh, we worked on this, and this is what I'm doing for the last 20-something years. Uh, we make an interconnect, barrier layers, self-assemble, monolayer cut, uh, activation, also gold plating. Um, we also work on micromagnetics, hard magnetics and soft magnetics, electroless for micromechanical system. And Micromechanical system, by the way, we can do bulk silicon, thin film, and polymers, and some of the MEMS are actually using magnetic thin films for the MEMS applications. And nanotechnologies, it's a work that I do, I, I'm doing now with Professor Ami Freeman and Professor Judith Rishpon and a little bit with Udi Gazit and people from the life science department. So let's talk a little bit about interconnects. The idea, we wanted to make a copper nanowires or copper lines completely by wet, by electroless plating. So you take the insulator, deposit uh, what we call a barrier layer, which is cobalt or nickel alloy. Then we put copper also by electroless plating. And then we do the capping, the top layer also by electroless plating. So we can make what we call a whole, um, whole uh, wet process. And this is our first publications from 91 that we actually make nanowires. We didn't call it nano, it's called deep, deep submicron. And at that time, the, the lab at Cornell, I did it at Cornell University using the Joel E-beam system. It's called the microfabrication facility. At when, when we got the budget for the nano center, we just changed the title on the wall. We kept doing what we do, what we did. And the reason why we, we're very excited. This was almost like first experiment. We, get, we got such beautiful lines and very reproducible. This was more important. It's not just we got beautiful uh, line. It was defined by photoresist, but the texture and the line and the quality of the metal was interesting. But even more interesting is that I'm in electrical engineering and we work on interconnect. So the technique is called damascene. You take the insulator, you dig a trench, you fill it with metal. Now. If you, what you want, you want a defect-free structure. You don't want any defects inside. If you don't do it correctly, you get some seam in the center or, or a void. So people were invented in IBM, a group of uh, uh, Angelakos and his colleagues. They invented what they call the superfilling technique. Superfilling technique by electroplating that it's a method that by putting additives into the solution, the plating at the bottom of the trench is much faster than the plating on the shoulders of the trench. So what you got, you got, it's going up. Because if you don't do it, you got anti-conformal and conformal. So what after we discovered the plating, uh, uh, that we can do electroless plating on nanostructures. This is a work uh, that I did in Japan with uh, my colleagues from Japan. By putting uh, polyethylene glycol and some other additives into the solution, and you can see, I don't have the magic wand, but you can see that we can get the position. This is the beginning, next step, and then suddenly from the bottom, 
we got much faster deposition and we got super filling. So we got a very nice filling and this is a two more, this is a different, a different experiments with different group and this one we also put not only a, a polyethylene glycol is an inhibitor. It inhibits the deposition on the shoulders and doesn't do anything to the bottom. But if you put SPS, which is another additive, which is an accelerator, it accelerates the deposition at the bottom. So what you got, you got the position that starts from the bottom and hoops, everything is, it's, it's very amazing because initially it's slow, then suddenly it's, being, it's accelerated and you got the position from the bottom. So this is, uh, this is even a much better experiment. So after we learned how to fill these structures, and this was about mid 2005, 2006, uh, we also in parallel worked on how to deposit very nice layers on side walls. This is, uh, this specific work is the PhD thesis of Masahiro Yoshino. I was one of the advisors, I spent one year in Japan. It was good, good experiment for me also. So we, uh, and, uh, and also there was, there was a work that was done in Japan and work which is done in Israel. Amit is here, no, he's not here. Professor Amit Cohen, which is now joining us. He developed uh, the f this taking for his PhD thesis that we made these structures. Uh, these are tre what you see here are trenches, uh, the position of metal. And if you, if you are very careful, you see here the electroless plating. And this electroless plating, this is 50 nanometer. So this layer is in the range of 20 nanometer. This is about 10 years ago. And you can see the conformity, how beautiful the electroless plating, this is taken from the top. And this, sorry, this one taken from the sides. And you can see the quality of the plating. It's this specific alloy was 0.9 cobalt, 0.02 tungsten, and 0.08 phosphorus. What we learned along the years, also how to control the composition, how to control the crystalline structure, how to control almost everything. So we gained a lot of experience. But the major breakthrough came by the work of a guy named C.K. Hu in IBM, who discovered that if you take a copper wire and you push current, you have electromigration. So you measure mean time to failure. And then what he did, he used our passivation that was developed by the PhD of Amit and put it on top and see what happens. This is mean time to failure when you put on a copper metal just insulator. If you put electroless cobalt on top of it, mean time to failure, time to failure goes up by more than an order of magnitude. This was a breakthrough. Then they bought our patent. <laughs> also it was a financial breakthrough to the university. <laughs> but the bottom line is that one of the major applications of this electroless plating, the deposition of copper inhibits surface diffusion of atoms and inhibits one of the major sources for electromigration. So you can make what they, f they found, listen, time of failure of about 100 uh, been put here units, but it was, it's ours. Uh, and this is accelerated conditions at about 400, uh, I don't have the number here, but it's uh, measured at more than 300 degrees Celsius. I, I do have the temperature here, no, I don't. But basically some of the lines, you can put them forever and they don't break. No, 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 no measured electromigration. So this was a very, it was a breakthrough because you can make very reliable lines. Uh, another breakthrough was that how to cut, start the, how to start the catalytic reaction. Traditionally, people use palladium as a catalyst to initiate the deposition. But it was difficult to make nanostructure using palladium because it's, it was too gross. It's too, the, you can, it was difficult to control the nanoparticles. So we have now two different techniques. One technique is I will skip, to, I think the next slide is much better. You take the surface, you put some, you, you take the surface, the oxide surface, you put some, uh, you react with the surface and you have the uh, hydrogen, the interaction with the, uh, basically the hydrolysis on the surface. Then you get the next reaction and you, basically you can attract 
using silan compounds containing, this is a very, <laughs> excuse me for the kind of a gross chemistry here, and I believe you can have some comments on the chemistry, but the idea is to have some uh, reaction on the surface and link to the surface a self-assembled monolayer, and here I can bond, for example, if I put here, this is kind of a unknown, but I can bond whatever I like. For example, I can put, if I go back, if I put amine groups on the top, NH2, and I can dip it in a complex palladium solution, I can generate nanoparticles, and this is kind of a nanoparticles, this is the size of the nanoparticles. Before the catalysis, this is what we see, this is the XPS and TEM results. The XPS, before the catalysis, there's nothing. After the catalysis, after we put the palladium, we get palladium 2 plus on the surface, and after immersion in dimethylamine boron, which is a reducing agent, we get palladium 2 plus. So we, not only we can deposit nanoparticles on the surface in a very controlled manner, and they are very small, but we can also control their oxidation state. So I will go so fast, it becomes animated. Once we have this palladium on the surface, we do electrolyze plating. And this is electrolyze plating with self-assembled monolayer. And this is electrolyze plating on the same substrate without self-assembled monolayer. And I don't think I, there's more to be said. It's a, we got very uniform deposition and very thin layers. And we can deposit today on plastics, which is very difficult to deposit on plastic. They're hydrophobic. What we do, we functionalize the surface. We generate OH groups using silanol. We have the reaction with the silanol, uh, with the toxic groups of the silanol, and we can continue with palladium activation. Next option is to use palladium nanoparticles. This, and this, now I'm moving with time. This was done, this was published recently, about two or three years ago. You take gold nanoparticles, you charge them using citrate, and they have a, they are negatively charged. Then you use the same self-assembled monolayer with the amine groups on top. And what we believe that happens, practically, the nanoparticle is attracted to the surface. And by the way, when we talk about uh, self-assembled monolayers, not all the molecules are standing straight. They can be, like, all over. So. And the coverage is not 100%. There are many problems. It's not as ideal as I described. But the, but the fact is that these are two types of self-assembled monolayers. We get very nice coverage. This work that we did, by the way, in collaboration with Noam, uh, a little bit. And uh, the, the, the data of the deposition rate. And an interesting picture, this is a high resolution TEM that was done with the help of Micron, with the new microscope, <laughs> done by Avi Rosenblatt, which is now the head of the quality lab at Intel. He's a PhD student that's under my supervision. These are the gold nanoparticles before, and this is after electrolyze plating. You see every, this is the nucleus, and this is the electrolyze plating, and this is after coalescence of the nuclei. So this is what happens. Electrolyze plating for magnetic is a big issue. I will not spare a lot of words, but we did a lot of work. Professor Osaka did a lot of work on this. I, this is practically most of his work. And magnetic domain images observed through the care effect. This specific one is a cobalt nickel iron phosphor soft magnetic underlayer for this substrate by electrolyze deposition. So electrolyze plating is being used and it's being commercialized. And this is kind of, I will not go through this table, this is a list of material that have been investigated, and you can see it's typically cobalt, nickel, and one side, phosphorus boron, and sometimes some other additives. So this is a list of materials that have been experimented, and we have data on those materials. So electrolyze plating for MEMS, uh, again, since we can deposit on plastics and deposit on polymers, you can think of, for example, if you take even typical beam structure, you can deposit metal on top of it. Why to deposit metal? Because sometimes, you, for example, for RF components, so you want to change the surface properties, you need metallic surfaces, and sometimes because you want uh, some co better conductivity on the surface. So electrolyze plating can be used for, electro for MEMS 
to modify the surface, and you can, in polymers, for example, if you take a very soft polymer, like sometimes we take polymers which are like rubber, PDMS, we mold them, and inside the mold we put metal, and this is the structure, because this is a flexible substrate, when you apply force, this thing can move, because this is a very soft plastic. So we can make soft material MEMS, which is kind of a growing field now, there's not much effort about, not, not, not a lot of publications, but it's an interesting topic. Or what we can do, we can put it all in a bigger substrate, bigger structures, and remove the flexible substrate after the position. So all in all, we can make a flexible, we can make MEM structures on silicon, MEM structures on polymers using electroless plating. The last part is, since our lab, we do a lot of electroless plating, why not deposit on biological material? Now, this is a big issue, because biological materials, they don't like very much deposition solutions. It has to be pH 7.2, 7.4. It has to be, you need to copy, you need, so you need to uh, deposit and keep the biological material alive. I mean, you, you want to keep it functional. You don't want to deposit and destroy it. And this was published by Alex Bittner recently in the book that he published. The, the, the concept is very simple. You take the biological material, you put some catalytic surface, and then you, have, you can deposit around it. So it sounds so simple. And this is an example. This is a work. Uh, this is the PhD thesis of one of my students that was published. Uh, this, this is not 19. This is the, this protein. We took this protein, which is a glucose oxidase. And one of the reasons, because it's a non-protein, it's a non-enzyme, very easy to measure. And you take this protein and you bind to it groups that later you bind to it palladium or platinum nanoparticles, the same technique that I showed before. Now, it's a more, you cannot put the self-assembled monolayer directly on protein uh, for the plain reason. Usually we use alcohol and <laughs> toluene for the <laughs> solvents. So you cannot put it in this. So we are more clever, we use glycan and beta-alanine or polyglutaraldehyde and beta-alanine, more complex structures, and then we bind platinum around it, or palladium, and then we do electroless plating. So this is a high-resolution TEM, no staining. This is a silver deposition on the surface of glucose oxidase. And now how do you know this thing is alive? You put it in a solution with sugar, and you study the, the en enzymatic properties. So this is untreated glucose oxidase. This is our uh, polyglutar activated glucose oxidase with silver on top of it, and this enzyme is functioning. We have silver around this enzyme, but the silver is, even in the TEM, the TEM looks, it's much, I would say, the TEM looks like very solid structures, but in fact, the metal nanopart, the metal the electrolyte plating somehow does not kill, sorry, does not destroy the enzyme, and the enzyme still function because you got this response. I mean, the enzyme is working. So we know how to deposit metals on enzymes. And by the way, this was published, I didn't put the date, this was published about five or six years ago. And since then, this is the standard techniques in our lab. If the young students even don't know that it took us about five years to develop it. It, 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 it was a major, very difficult problem, but if you want an engineer to do something, tell him it's impossible. Then he will do it. So when people told me it's impossible, we decided we do it. <laughs> so we managed to do it. So what is next? Uh, why is, is everything done in electroless plating? Uh, first, I believe that not, not we're just beginning. For example, the issue of printing. I believe that the industry of printing can benefit a lot from electroless plating. Because in printing, what is printing? You take ink and you print nanoparticles. So you can use it for the catalytic process. So you can either take a metal nanoparticle ink, uh, or you can take a post-print electroless process, which means you print the solution and do some post-processing, and the electroless printing is during the second, the post-processing. Why do you do it? One of the reasons is, for example, if you want to print copper, you can print copper, but copper will oxidize immediately. So one of the ideas that I work with Professor Shlomo Magdasi from Jerusalem is to print the solution which will generate the electroless plating after some post-process. So it actually the copper is generated after the printing. 
you can do seed printing, printing of the seed, or printing of the location of the seed. And you don't print the seed, but print the self-assembled monolayer, and then dip it in the solution. Uh, this one has a very big commercial advantage, because it's very fast. It's going to work. It's actually going to work. I'm going to show some samples. Another idea is why not having a integrating electroless plating with 3D printing? And this is a, prod this is a, a PhD thesis of Hefti Ragunas, one of our PhD students graduating soon. She is printing electrodes. You have a 3D printer. You put the design inside, wait half an hour, and you have electrodes you can use. And I can show you this. They are working, and she can demonstrate it. It's, it's a really beautiful technique. <laughs> we, are, we are a little slow now because we make it two parts, and we have to, it's, it's more complicated than it is, but you can actually print electrodes. Why we do it? We make like touch electrodes that we want to touch the tumor or touch some cell lines. So we needed some very complicated three-dimensional structure. So it took us about half a year to do it in the microfabrication lab. Now it takes out two hours to do it by 3D printing. So we want to merge electroless plating and 3D printing for many applications. So it's kind of, for example, for a radio frequency integrated circuits, and because we can combine metallic surfaces on plastic surfaces. We bought this printer thanks to the Ministry of, Eco Ministry of Economy. It's a $60,000 functional printing that we can print any nanoparticle ink that you can put, we can put our hands in the market. So we print many things, but we also print, uh, print uh, thing, uh, sorry, we print seed layers, uh, mainly silver that we get from many, many suppliers, and we are now trying seeding by, we have now about 10 or more than 10 different inks that we are experimenting. This, uh, to show you, this, is, this was printed by 3D printer. Imagine a 3D printer printing something, and on this, you print the seed, and then you put it in an electroless plating solution. So this is a part that was 3D printed, and on top of it, we printed the seed, and then we put it in electroless plating, and we got these lines. This is, so this is the result. And the main problem now is what exactly happening there, because ink is ink, it's not clean, etc. So we have a model. And the last slide is related to the previous talk how to put the nanoparticles, the metal nanoparticle in the position on the polymers. We can do it self assemble monolayers, but we also now experimenting by nanoparticle implantation called supersonic cluster beam implant samples that we get from Leuven and also from Milano. And this is an interesting technique because we can have nanoparticles with a very accurate shape and very accurate composition. We are now doing experiments. This is like palladium or gold or palladium 10%, 20%. So we can actually change the composition and the shape of the structures and study their catalytic effect on electroless plating. This is an ongoing research we do now. So conclusions are very simpler. Electroless plating can be done. It can be combined with printing. It can combine it. We can com you can combine it with many other techniques. And thank you. This introduction to your talk. Yeah, very good one, actually. So, any questions? Yes. How much control do you have over uh, the grain size and texture and uh, oxygen content? Uh, I feel we have, I mean, we have very good control. I mean, we are, after 20 years, we focusing on small number of metals. We have uh, hundreds of solutions. Each one is tailored for a specific thickness, a specific grain size. Uh, and there are also there are the combination. So what's typical for a grain size? Are they, are they strongly textured? Yes. And uh, the grain size, can, it can be amorphous. A certain composition of cobalt, tungsten, and phosphorus, you can get a completely amorphous layer. You can get what we call amorphous with embedded nanos crystalline inside. This is Amit in his PhD thesis. He dealt with uh, electroless plating alloy, nickel, cobalt tungsten, and phosphor, which is mostly amorphous with crystalline nanostructures embedded. You can make it nanocrystalline. Or in the case of copper and silver, silver you can make very large grains. Silver has this tendency for secondary grown grains, uh, secondary 
secondary crystal growth and you can have uh, large grains. It's not as big as electroplating. Electroplating grains are much bigger. So it's, but you can get, uh, you get a variety of grains. It depends on the composition and the additives. So we can put additives to enhance grains, to reduce grains. You can get very flat surfaces. So we sometimes we do dend dendritic growth, dendritic growth on purpose. For example, we grow porous materials also in purpose, so we can get very large surface area. By the way, you can also grow oxide, like zinc oxide. You can grow electrolyzed plating by zinc oxide. This is what we do also. I didn't talk about it, but you can grow. Uh, this is an interesting work I do with Igal. He's not here. On uh, doing a laser annealing of uh, oxides, which are deposited by electrolyzed plating. You get very nice structures. But the I, don't, I, I don't have a very good answer to your question. The thing. It's a very, there's a very wide range. Yeah, I just wonder about uh, how much of this is going to be reproducible into that range of. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Compared to vapor, which is what we just Listen, if, if you, you're in your PC today, the metal lines are copper metallization done by electroplating. Electroplating copper is the dominant technology today for metallization of VLSI. So even if even it's wet, electroplating can produce beautiful metal in very large grain size, uh, if you're interested. So I agree, wet in, compared to vacuum is different, but I don't think you can, I'm, I'm biased. I'm working on wet deposition for a long time. You can get very high quality metals also. Yes. Is the weight of anything by which the growth rate at the bottom is higher than the growth rate at the top? Okay. I'll make it simple. No. You, have pu you put inhibitor and accelerator. The inhibitor is a large molecule, so it's very difficult to diffuse inside. The accelerator is a small molecule, can diffuse very fast at the bottom. So after the first few seconds, when you consume your additives, the bottom, there is a deficiency of inhibitor. So simple, took us a lot of time, took us 10 years to develop it. And IBM won, we work in parallel and they published first. Yes, sorry. I, I honestly, we don't fully understand it today. The publication and the work done by IBM, it's a, a suppression of the surface diffusion of defects. But what defects and how the suppression is done, I'm not sure there is a full answer to this. I know. But uh, when you make very, when you make nanostructures, the line is typically bamboo structures, and uh, we're talking about nanowires. So there, there is electromigration due to nucleation at triple points, and also due to nucleation on the surface. I don't think uh, much work was done because they were so happy with the initial results, which is a kind of amorphous with uh, an... Uh, it's actually true. But it's, it's a very interesting discovery. It was a little unexpected, but now we say, of course. Sorry, I think we'll, as the chairman of the session, I need to control the time also. <laughs> so I will dismiss the previous speaker and introduce the chairman of our department, Noam, which is really, without him, this, uh, not only this conference would not happen, so with all his energy and spirit, and I'm also very glad that he's working in a topic close to what I'm doing, so it's, uh, Noam.